Well, hello and welcome to Lit Up Session 7. We are so excited to have you all here today. Our topic, as you know, is funny stuff. So we're looking forward to just getting some laughs during this uh, kind of crazy time that we're all in. My name is Julie Corlett. I am from the Southern California News Group. And before we get started, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items. Um, number one, you are all the attendees are muted and um, off screen. That is just so that our panelists and our interviewers can do their thing. Um, we do have a question and answer op option so that if you have any questions or if you want to chat, we do have people here who will be monitoring that and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. We have a very full day here today. Um, also, we are videotaping this and everybody who has registered, we will make that link available afterwards. Um, that's all I have for housekeeping. I want to bring us to the next part, and that is introducing Samantha Dunn. She is an award-winning journalist. Um, she is author of several of her own books, and she currently has the role of editor for specialty publications for the Southern California News Group. So um, with that, I would like to introduce Sam Dunn. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, Julie. We, we have to stop meeting like this every know, Friday. Yes. Become a date. People will talk. Um, thank you also to our valued subscribers who, who are tuning in every week. We really appreciate it. And to everybody else who joins us for this salon style conversation with writers and performers, I guarantee you there will be a, a variety of perspectives and uh, uh, opinions. So enjoy that. Um, I just want to say we really value you as subscribers, and we couldn't bring uh, you events like this without your support. So thank you. Now it is my extreme pleasure to introduce the uh, author of Mad Woman and the Roomba. She is also an NPR commentator who you've probably heard. And she was once, um, she's got so many things I could tell you about. I, I'm, I'm not going to bother with the whole thing, but she was once uh, named by Variety as one of the 50 most influential comedians in America. My friend and yours, Sandra Singlo. Hello, Samantha. And I Hello. believe that was for uttering some profanity on the radio, a mistake I shan't repeat on this family show. Please. <laughs> I value my job. Please. <laughs> Yes. So I guess when we started putting this together, this particular program, which we're so excited about, there's a question, humor in the pandemic? Possible? <laughs> necessary. It is necessary. I think it is always necessary in times to laugh. It's actually good for your nervous system to do. And, uh, and it is something about kind of keeping us going in hot summers and times of confusion and whatever, we have to take these breaks. And I think that sometimes we think of humor as you know being the late night talk shows, but those can be political. Is that really a break? Is that really a break from Not life? For me. No, Not for me right now. <laughs> you're going ha ha ha. Uh. So what I love about all of our writers today is they're very human, they're very personal. They talk about the lives that we all live, the things that we all think. And so we're hoping this will truly be a break. And just in reviewing all of their work, I spent the last two days just like laughing and it felt really good. So yeah, it's the best medicine, there. girl. It is it the is best medicine. It is indeed. So with that, as with the great British baking show, you go to your tent and we'll see you. <laughs> bye bye. We'll see you shortly. And pivot, although we start to hate that word, so I won't use it, turn immediately to our first fantastic guest, guest Meryl Marco. To refresh your memory, perhaps, although she is a national treasure that you should know who she is, uh, here's the 30 second download while Meryl sits in her beautiful studio and listens and perhaps, you know, well, I do this, okay. So Meryl Marco is a multiple Emmy Award winning head writer for the original Dave Letterman show, which actually started as a morning show, I believe. She created most of Letterman's original concepts, stupid pet tricks, stupid human tricks, viewer mail, and the remote segments. 
other TV writing credits. I'm going to start speaking quickly because there are so many. New Heart, Sex and the City, Moonlighting. She won a Writers Guild Award for her writing and performing on HBO's Not Necessarily the News. Her periodical credits, too numerous to name all. Rolling Stone, Esquire, New York Times, even Buzz Magazine in LA that I just said because I, I'm fond of that magazine in our history. Her eight books of essays and fiction include a not complete list, How to Be ha ha Happy Like Me, It's My effing birthday, hilarious, cool, calm, and contentious, Meryl Marco's Guide to Love, and What the Dogs Have Taught Me. Those two titles are interestingly possibly related as well. Now, think, her, yes. I think you just lost me, or I lost you. Uh, okay, are we hearing you? You All are. Right. <laughs> so I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, then we're good. Okay. All right. And your cartoons have appeared, and I'll speak directly to you. Your cartoons have appeared in The New Yorker, and your first graphic novel, We Saw Scenery, will be published by Algonquin Books on October 13th. Pre order now. Welcome, national comedy treasure, Meryl Marco. Hello. <laughs> I'm not getting any picture, though. I, I see. Wait a minute. You look great. I do. I know. I must look great. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. <laughs> I, the picture went away, but I but I can just talk to you as though it's a radio interview. And, yeah, and I'll tell you if any parsley appears in your teeth or anything like that, but I'll say you look fantastic. You appear to be in a fantastic music studio, um, and, um, and, and I look amazing too, and we all look amazing. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, there you are. You're back. Okay. Yay. Okay. So we're going to be talking about your childhood when we talk about your fantastic new graphic novel, We See Scenery. But I wonder if you could, you know, just in February of this year, 2020, it seems hard to remember that early, uh, you won the 2020 Patty Chayefsky Award uh, for the Writers Guild. It was a Laurel Award for television writing. And you were honored, and it was no small thing, for basically inventing modern late night television, paving the way for today's Colbert, Fallon, Kimmel, etc. So would you mind, Ms. Marco, taking us back to, do you remember pre-modern late night TV, the Johnny Carson days, what was that like, the way you saw it, and what did you felt needed to be changed? Well, I saw it as uh, extremely boring. I did not have that in common with Mr. Letterman. I was never a fan of Carson. I just thought he was, Letterman always told me that he saw Carson as um, your hip uncle that you would like to make laugh. I saw Carson as an icy businessman who would look elsewhere if he, when I talked to him and then would quickly move somewhere else in the room. He just looked like nobody I could relate to. And they didn't really have women on that show unless they were there to flirt, which was, is never my favorite kind of um, repartee unless right. we're bleeding to something. Right. And so, uh, so that, that was uh, the predecessor. In fact, this would be a little bit interesting for you, I think, is before we took over his time, um, we didn't take his time slot, did we? We, took, we were on after him, but he owned the time slot. Right. And so he, uh, he got to say a few things about the, what we were gonna organize. So he said, all right, you can't have um, uh, an announcer come and sit down with the host, and um, you're not allowed to do stump the band, and we don't want you to do a monologue. That's my property. And, um, and those are the three things that you're not allowed to do. And I just remember thinking, are you kidding? That leaves everything else in the world. <laughs> so, so, uh, so those were the differences between the shows. I was always seeing what we were doing as, as trying to bring everything to the show besides Step the Band, which was nothing I ever wanted any part of anyway. And so, and of course, your the one of the very famous things you invented was stupid pet tricks. Can you talk about how you came up with the idea for that? Well, um, it was actually Dave had a morning show before he had the the night show, and on the morning show, it was just basically he and I sitting in a room trying to think what goes on the show uh, before it got canceled, of course. And uh, and I remember thinking, well, uh, when I was in college, I was sitting in a room full of friends and they had a Doberman Pinscher and two of them made like a half an hour of entertainment out of putting socks on the dog. And we all, oh, how we laughed at those socks on the dog. <laughs> but I remember thinking, I think everybody does that. I think everybody puts socks on their dog and then just sits around and watches it. And that was basically the idea. The other story I have about Stupid Petrix is that when um, 
when the show transitioned from the morning show to the night show, NBC sat me down with uh, network executives to talk about how focus groups had reacted to the morning show, which of course was canceled. And, uh, and so they wanted, hoping for greater success in the night show. And they, uh, they told me that uh, they, the focus groups liked stupid petricks, but they would prefer that we do it with trained animals. <laughs> and I said, oh, so you mean like a horse that can count? Or, and they said, yeah. So we just ignored that. <laughs> but, but everything that it wasn't, you know, the whole idea was that it wasn't going to be a horse that can count. So, so and, and I think they're listening to your speech, which was so hilarious and fantastic for that. And I think it's going to connect maybe a little later when we talk about your book. I love the, the your new graphic novel, um, We Saw Scenery, about the notion of being a funny girl that when and that when you were young, you realized, oh, I'm a funny girl, I'm not sure what category that is, or if that's a good thing. I yeah, mean, there was no category, really. Right. I mean, there was Phyllis Diller, and, um, uh, and then right. there was the lady that Groucho Marx made fun of in those movies, uh, Margaret Dumont. It was just not, a, I, I love Lucy. She was right. uh, somebody's wacky wife. And I mean, there really wasn't a category the way there is now. It was sort of no man's land. Right, but you were there, yeah, yeah, often you'd say with next to a stage of people, eight, eight, eight or 10 guy, white guys in baseball caps and you, and I think that it is, and, and that's why I was just thinking about that while reading your- When I was on the Letterman show, you mean, that's what was my writing staff. Was right, right. And white guys in baseball caps. Right, and so, but I think, and then we're gonna go back, I'm jumping around a little bit about that sort of being comfortable as an outsider, I, it sort of came to you early, and, and we're going to muse on that in a moment because I have just been immersed in your novel, in your graphic novel, so I'm flashing on every scene in your childhood. Right, um, but I always felt like an outsider. I mean, to this day, I still feel like an outsider. It's just how I relate to things. I think it's kind of common in comedy. Right, right. Um, so, for, second question, because there's there's going to be a fair amount of dog musings in your book, and you write so much about your dogs so hilariously. And so your book uh, was What the Dogs Have Taught You, one of them. And so one of the questions for people who are being introduced that book to that book, what have your dogs taught you? And have they taught you anything new in the pandemic? Uh, the dogs, I, I just love living with animals. If I could have one, two of every species like Noah, I would, you know, <laughs> the, the dogs play along and that's why I have dogs. Uh, but for me, they're kind of like um, exchange students from Neptune. They're living um, among you and on your furniture and they're playing along with their rules, but you're not sure they have any idea what your rules even mean. So, uh, so what, when it gets down to what the dogs have taught me, I guess one thing would be that staring at someone all day long doesn't necessarily produce um, any kind of great activity. It always looks to me like they think I'm going to do something really wonderful <laughs> any moment now if they just stare at me hard enough or if they stare at underneath a seat that food will be produced because it, it happens a certain amount of the time. I guess that's they taught me that and they also taught me that it's not always cookie time. It might be cookie time a lot of the time, but not every time is not cookie time. Right, and, and I, I remember and one of the most enduring things was your, your dog, Louie, who had the greeting disorder, which is one of the funniest. Well, know. yeah, that to me is the example there is the way that I differentiate between dogs and people. I give dogs a lot more leeway than I give people. Like I had a dog, Louis, who when you came to my house, uh, the thing he would do to let you know how welcome you were is run into the living room and start to hump the cushions. And... Uh, <laughs> And this was his idea of saying, welcome to my home. You're so welcome here. And, um, and actually it, it sort of helped separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of who was gonna be my friends or not. Because, but I used to think to myself, okay, so what if this was my husband, Lewis? And uh, because I found it kind of charming that Lewis would be humping the cushions in front of everybody. I just always laughed at it and found it funny. And I thought, so what if this was my husband, Lewis? And when a friend came over, I would say, okay, just want to warn you, when you come into my house, my husband, Lewis is going to run into the living room and masturbate. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's just his way of welcoming you to my home. <laughs> He's just saying, welcome to my home. That's such a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful work. story. Right, it's a beautiful story. It's very, very inspiring. <laughs> okay, so to your new book, uh, We Saw Scenery, I, I have to say that 
for and it's available in October. People should pre-order. The transition of your voice to graphic novel is fantastic. I'm not always a fan of graphic novels, and this is so seamless and um, hilarious. And I, I would say, I, I, I sort of, I lived in that era also. For me, it was kind of like a Mad Magazine version of kind of like a 60s girlhood, which was so real, it just all made super sense. So I'm wondering if along the way, and, and just, and, and I think even the moments for me where home ec classes were kind of like taking a can opener, opening some fruit salad, and then making you a fruit cocktail, and it's so elegant. It. it was so cringeworthy but hilarious. I and just, we had to take that class too, and it could only be girls. It could only be <laughs> girls. Only girls remember, could learn to open that can. Yeah, and we had Foxy Franks, which are Oscar Mayer hot dogs and ketchup, and you guys had so many ways to cook eggs, which is so inspiring. That was Girl Scouts. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right, right. So um, I wonder what gave you the idea, I have so many questions about this, is drawing fun, because your illustrations are fantastic, what gave you the idea to make it a graphic novel? Were you inspired by uh, any other things along the way to make this fantastic book? Well, two things gave me the idea to make it a graphic novel. One is I went and got a master's degree in art before I ever started any of this stuff, and I've never used it ever since. I taught art at USC for one year. And then I, I transitioned into television because they had a big film department and it had never occurred to me to go into a film department because UC Berkeley didn't have one that I was aware of. So, so I got excited and I changed careers while I was teaching at USC, which didn't ex exactly make the art department that happy. But uh, that was one way. And the other is uh, Linda Berry. Do you, are you familiar with her work? Of course, yes, totally. And so she teaches this class, um, that I, I sort of audit by watching what she posts online. I just love, I, actually I took her class, one, she, one of her seminars. I love the way that she translates everything into the personal, et cetera. And, um, and she was, uh, well, wait a minute, what was I talking about? I've just now lost art. it. I started thinking about Linda Berry. Yeah, um, drawing and art. She, and well, one of the things she has you do is uh, do a little drawing of your day kind of, and I started doing that. I started keeping a diary. I've been keeping diaries since I was little. And, um, and I started keeping a diary the way that she was, which was just doing a drawing of my day, which was so much more interesting than the diaries I was keeping in my 20s, where it was just whining about love. Oh, you know, he did this, and then you know what else he said? And then you're, those are just dreary to read. But when you do a little drawing every day, it's like, wow, I forgot I went to Trader, Trader Joe's and that lady said that thing to me. You know, it's, so then I started doing that every day. And then I started thinking, well, you know, what, what would happen if I keep, I was keeping these little diaries. And um, wow. this is where it started. I found these in my office. And the thing that really <laughs> made me laugh about it is it has a lock and a key on it. Like when I was 10, the top secret information that I was hoarding <laughs> in here, you've got to lock it up at night, you know? So, so, uh, that was making me laugh. And I sat down to read them just wondering what in the hell was I keeping under lock and key like that? Nothing I write now is that important. And, uh, and, and then I, I re-encountered myself as a person I barely recognized. Right, which is hilarious. That was the first movement of somebody that you barely recognize. And then your diary, so your relationship to your diary, first the diary keeps that person. The second time the diary reminds you of things that you have forgotten. And then sometimes a diary can kind of be used as something to protect yourself in the future to say, you didn't do this or that or the other. So, and you use that memorably, that page that you would wave on the Dave Letterman show to hilarious effect. So it's kind of like, right. <laughs> kind of like I, I, pro I find that funny. I'm pretty sure. I, that <laughs> it was, video was very embarrassing. He was looking at me like, uh oh, uh oh. Yeah, but, what's <laughs> it was an amazing and hilarious diary. I mean, it, it really, it was such amazing television to watch. And so, I bothered to bring a page that had nothing on it because I wanted, I, I wasn't going <laughs> to reveal him. Wow. Uh, studio. wow. I brought a, a page that just said basically, uh, it had a big lead in it and then it just said basically nothing. Oh my God. Okay, so that's pretty mind blowing. That's new lore to add to your book that's coming about, uh, about diary making. Um, so, okay, well, I also want to say, because we're in California, this is a Southern California show. There is, you know, you grew up in North Miami, which is kind of Dave Barry's coming on. So the whole Miami, California connection is kind of eerie. Woo! But I'm growing, moving from Miami to California, you wrote, my two most reliable new California friends were depression and sarcasm. 
<laughs> yeah, they're still my friends. I really make good friends. <laughs> but they have, be I guess maybe they have become your friends because has California fueled you in some way or? Oh, California is, is I, I mean, I really feel grateful that my parents moved. It was a huge trauma to me at the time. It was like, how can you, I'm a made man in Florida. How can you do this to me? How can you move me to California and make me start all over again? But I mean, the starting all over again turned me into who I turned out to be the person I was in Florida I is fairly embarrassing in in a lot of ways and and that was part of what was interesting to me when I was reading about myself is just the stuff <laughs> the weird warped values of course it was also eighth grade and who really has anything but warped values in the eighth grade I think that's part of the curriculum isn't it <laughs> <laughs> and jello making and egg making yeah, yeah. No, and, and I think that I, I just love the fact that you were kind of following the beats and art school and Kerouac and that you, and I, I just found it inspiring and I'm sort of, I'm going to buy many copies of this book and give it to everybody I know because I think, I think just trying to figure out how to be an artist and a female or whatever and a person and a writer and a funny person, I just, it was hilarious, but also I uh, kind of moving. Well, thank you. That's very, very kind of you. That makes me feel really good. It was an embarrassing book to put together because it was so full of weird personal details that you can't tell whether anybody's going to relate to it or not. And you think, I mean, that, but what was interesting to me when I was reading that diary is like I had a page that was called the worst day of my life. This is the worst day of my life. And I had no memory of it. And that <laughs> I thought was so interesting. The stuff that you save and the stuff that you throw away. You know, I remembered every creepy boy I had a crush on. But the worst day of my life, I blanked it out completely. And on that inspiring note, <laughs> thank you so much, Meryl Marco. Uh, the book is the book is fantastic. It's coming out Algonquin Books in October, I believe, October thirteenth. Get it before the election comes down. Um, and it's it's we saw scenery, and it's absolutely incredible. I, I think it's 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 appropriate for any woman of a certain age, but also teens. Really I, by the way, the title um, comes from the fact that that was basically what I called in my diary, what I called everything that wasn't me, scenery. <laughs> <laughs> we went on a vacation, we saw scenery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, Meryl Marco, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a fan of scenery, a sometime fan of scenery. Okay. And now to our next guest um, that we're so excited to have, and that is the Orange County Register's very own Marla Jo Fisher. So, and I'm going to bring um, Samantha Dunn on to come help introduce. Um, and um, to do, do our 30 second download in a little bit slightly different way. Hello, Samantha. I figure you guys are working for the same publication. So why don't I have you do some of the work or the joyous work? Fine, I will do some of the joyous work. You can tell them about her amazing column and we'll get into that. But I want to tell you about the book that's coming out, which is based on these columns. Never mind the real housewives of Orange County. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the woman everybody actually relates to with her bad parenting, her rotten dogs, her ill health, her fashion faux pas etc etc uh we won't even start with the kids she's our syndicated columnist for the orange county register and for nearly two decades marla joe my friend um has been entertaining people with her subversive humor her cranky intellect and most of all her huge heart and has led us through the ridiculousness of suburban motherhood um, the book is going to be coming out from Prospect Park, uh, a regional publisher in um, November, should be in, t in time for it to be in your hands for Thanksgiving. So with that, I want to introduce you to my friend, Marla Jo, if she can figure out how to work the computer. She did! She figured it out! Yay! Yay, Marla Jo. And I just want to add, I think you the, the column is called Frumpy Middle-Aged Mom, and you also write uh the cheapo travel column if i may I did. yes and you did because and my first question for you before we talk further because i'm burning on this question is um and you got to write it due to your status as the cheapest person alive to me well, i understand that yeah that you're arguing about that now right, right with your dad i'm arguing about that so i just want to throw down with my dad how che how cheap was he um okay so my dad lived in malibu he's a chinese engineer he dumpster dived 
for like, uh, you know, expired sushi and ladies underpants that no. he would wear on the beach. At Starbucks, he would pour things together and drink other people's Starbucks and he would hitchhike up and down Pacific Coast High with, with, with myself, although he had a car. Don't you think that's pretty cheap? How cheap are you, Marla? Okay, John? I have to say that I, I honestly think your dad is a winner, okay? I thought I was cheap because I had a matching love seat and uh, sofa set that I bought at the Salvation Army for less than $200. I know, in my mind, that's cheap, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of everything in mind. When I look around my house, almost everything I own came from a thrift shop. My daughter, who I'm deeply proud to say is a now 21-year-old thrift shopper, bought a pair of uh, sunglasses at a thrift shop the other day for one penny. So you know, I go through my refrigerator and I eat the things that are going to go bad first in a very systematic way so that I don't waste food. So, that, um, right, right? That's pretty good. I, okay. Can you see that chair behind me? Seven dollars. Yeah. Seven dollars from Coco's Family Restaurant. But you have actually nicer furniture than I do, I think. Oh no, you have such a beautiful house. I've just been sitting here like admiring your house so much. It's so gorgeous. This room, thank you so much. And, and that also was from a yard sale. So we could do this all, you know, we could do this all day, but I appreciate <laughs> you guys, that because you're calling you guys are killing me. Okay, let me just break in here and say you're both the cheapest, weirdest people I know. <laughs> oh, thank you. Sandra and that those those chairs from Coco's anyway Marla please uh, just to give some people who don't know this the small number of people who don't know your column you know this this is the woman who writes seriously can it be that hard to put away a spoon other hits include no officer that's not my child <laughs> and kids Led Zeppelin is not a mineral um, I just have to ask you, Marla, how did you even begin the column? Tell us. Well, this is what happened. I was a hard news reporter for many, many years for a lot of different newspapers. I was an investigative reporter. I loved my job so much. I would work from early in the morning until late at night. And basically, I forgot to have children. And then I woke up one day and I realized I was 43 years old. I had no husband because I was too crabby for anybody to ever want to marry me. And I had no children, right? And I always wanted to adopt foster kids because my mom was a foster kid and I wanted to, you know, help foster kids. So I applied to the county to adopt foster kids. But when they arrived, finally, three years later, they were three and five years old. I had absolutely no idea what I was in for. I have all new respect for moms everywhere because I almost killed them the first couple of days. I mean, I just... What did I know? I knew absolutely nothing. You know what I'm saying? I knew more about how to loop the interior of my car than I did about how to raise children. It still blows my mind that the county gave me these kids, right? And so I just was so, I just had to write it down because that's what I do. I'm a writer, you know? So I started writing this stuff down. And at my age, maybe at all ages, I don't know. But at my age, I was so exhausted every single second that, you know, you know they would always talk about how, after your kids go to bed, you get your me time, right? We <laughs> sit around with your apple martini and you watch, uh, you know, Sopranos, right? My me time after my kids went to bed was crawling into bed and passing out cold, you know? And, uh, and so then all of a sudden I'm inundated with all this advice from everyone, from your friends and your employers and every magazine and every TV show and every newspaper about how to be smarter and better and be a better mother and be a better spouse and be a better coworker, you know, and, and it was just too much. You know, it was just, I was so overwhelmed by it that I lived in a perpetual state of guilt, you know, because I wasn't doing everything right. And then I saw this little stand up that Roseanne Barr did back when she was still called Roseanne Barr, right? And she said that, and she came, she would come out and she'd be like, if the kids are alive at 5 p.m., I've done my job. And that became my mantra. It's like, I kept them alive today, okay? Maybe they didn't eat everything. Maybe I gave them McDonald's, right? You know, but I kept them alive. And so I just started writing all of this out about how bad of a mother I am and how I was so concerned that I wouldn't be able to keep my children alive that day, right? And it just poured out of me. And so they started running it in this mom blog that at the time the Orange County Register had, and it got more and more response. So finally they decided to make me a columnist. 
And wow, I got so much response from people because I was talking about how pathetic I was, right? And I, I truly, I was completely serious. I was really pathetic. And people were like, oh, you're one of us, right? You know, like even I was a little bit afraid to do this podcast because when I'm on the air, I'm pathetic. And the last time I did anything on the air, I did a TV show and I was walking out and thinking what hot stuff I was for doing this TV show. And then I looked down and realized my blouse was on inside out. <laughs> and um, it was just, it was just, so much and actually it started running my column started running all over the country and it ran in the deseret news which is owned by the mormon church in, in utah and i really just got an outpouring of responses from these mormon moms who are under tremendous pressure to be perfect mom and uh they really related and they would write to me and say i can't let anybody know that i'm writing to you but thank you thank you thank you thank you you know so uh, as the kids were little, I just wrote, like, I wrote about, you know, how I let my son go to school one day in a wet shirt and how, you know, when the, the principal calls and tells you your son blew up the bathroom, you know, like at the school, <laughs> and, you know, and you tell your son, I really thought you would be older than nine before you got community service, you know, and it's never a good thing. Now, you moms know this. It is never, never a good thing when you get a call from the school. You know what I mean? The school <laughs> never calls you to tell you your kid's on the dean's list. Your kid call, you know, you, you, the school calls you to tell you that the, the school resource officer found him on the roof smoking a joint, you know? That didn't actually happen, okay? But, you know, but it could happen. So, um, so yeah, in fact, Sandra, I remember uh, your book, Mom on Fire, which, by the way, I don't know if Sam told you that I read in the parking lot of Folsom Prison. Um, <laughs> was, uh, when you were talking about, you know, the kindergarten quandaries and all the people that are so obsessed with every little aspect of their kid. Well, I was a full-time working mom and I just couldn't, I just couldn't. So that's what was the, that was 12 years ago. And I just started writing about what a screw up I am. And 12 years later, and my, my latest riff that I've been on in my column has been about my horrible travel screw ups right? Where every travel mistake I ever made, including going to Thailand and forgetting to bring underwear. <laughs> you cannot buy plus size Thailand uh, underwear in Thailand, trust me on this, okay? And um, so, so yeah, it's just me writing about my endless series of screw-ups, and people seem to relate to it. You know, they write to me and they say, like, you're one of us, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of am. So anyway, that's, and I've been doing it all these years and just really kind of having a blast doing it. So that's why I'm really excited to be writing a book. Doing well, a book. people have had a blast reading it. And that's why my father would dumpster dive because he needs that Thailand big underwear, or in his case, very tiny <laughs> underwear. Um, so what a pleasure. And you have so many fans. You're so beloved. I mean, they're writing in, a, in, in the chat. And so when we should say that your new book is, it all, always goes by too quickly, doesn't it, Samantha? <laughs> your new book is, the frumpy middle-aged mom dispatches from the front lines of motherhood coming from Prospect Park Books in, um, in, in November. And you can see the chat link to get on the email list for this, for sure. So all fans and new fans, old fans and new fans get on it because it's going to be hilarious. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marla Jo Fisher and Samantha Dunn for the moment. Okay. And so now we, 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 we turn to our final guest to, of today, um, direct from the Southern California of the East, as I like to call it, Florida, the great Dave Barry. Now, if you, if you even need one, here is the 30 second download on Mr. Dave Barry called the funniest man in America by the New York Times, but who can believe them? That would be the kind of thing that would be in your bio. Pulitzer Prize winning syndicated Miami Herald humor columnist Dave Barry has written more than 30 books, just to name a few. Babies and Other Hazards of Sex, Dave Barry Turns 40, Dave Barry Turns 50, Dave Barry's Us from Mars and Venus, Dave Barry's Money Secrets, Dave Barry Does Japan, Dave Barry's Book of Bad Songs, Dave Barry in Cyberspace, Dave Barry's Complete Guide to Guys and Novels, Big Trouble Lunatics, Tricky Business, and most recently Insane City. His books inspired the CBS sitcom Dave's World, starring Harry Anderson, who it said played a slightly taller version of Dave Barry. His newest book is Lessons from Lessons from Lucy. And I, I but I would say, as kind of the flavorette, 
One of Barry's columns was largely responsible for the movement to observe International Talk Like a Pirate Day every year on September 19th. This is from the author's website. This is probably most, his most enduring achievement. And with that, I say, Ahoy thar, Dave Barry, how goes ye? See, that's what your presence elicits. Instant immaturity, silliness, and pirate talk. Arr. That's That's pretty much it. I mean, one of the things I learned from Talk Like a Pirate Day <laughs> is that there's really not a lot of things that people can say as pirate beyond R. A lot, and, you know, you get, I, which is, might be why there's no pirates around anymore. They just, no, or the word hornpipe is used a lot. Um, see, I, I didn't, I'd forgotten about hornpipe. Yeah, what the, hornpipe, hell, what the hell is a hornpipe? I don't know, but it doesn't sound appropriate for a family show, I would say. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to open the first question because, as you know, this is the Southern California News Group is doing this show. We yeah. feel very wounded here in California because I believe you began writing a humor column at 22.50 each day for something called the Daily Local News in California. No, no. No. N not true. It isn't. Daily local, local News is in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Westchester, Pennsylvania. Completely different place from Southern California. Right, and you, you were doing news reporting on municipal courts in that, I, I believe. But did yeah, you yeah, get I, writing I, in California, or did I get that? Was that something I'm dreaming of? I never, I lo never lived in California at all. You never I'm lived and wrote in California. Well, no, I, my column used to run, um, a, as did Marla Joe's column, in the in the Orange County Register, and a bunch uh -huh. of papers out there. Uh -huh. But I never, I never lived there that I'm aware of. Even like when I was, you know, doing drugs, I don't think. Rem uh -huh. I don't remember. I have no, no memory. Still pivot to my first question, given okay, the, uh, because you did write. Uh, but first, I think that um, the, the audience is like very, very concerned about what's behind you. What? What? Oh uh, yeah, you're this being is... you're being attacked by a massive dog. This is it going to this... eat? Marsha Milcher, sec, Milcher says, "Is the huge dog going to eat Dave Barry?" This dog is. Uh, it, it's actually just. I please report just a picture of a dog. The actual dog is larger. No, not, she's close to that side. That's that's Lucy, my dog Lucy. Um, and I, you know, I like you do these Zoom things, and behind me in real life is kind of like this random semi kitchen thing. So I thought I'll do something that looks a little more professional and put a gigantic dog there. And that's yeah. You appear to be seated just before the dog's nose, so that is very professional yeah. indeed. Okay, so do, go back to my arduous question. Really, okay, we feel bad anyway, that apparently then you didn't write here, even though it feels like you could have written here. So can you, you've written a lot about, talked a lot about Miami, where yeah. you live, where you continue to live, and yeah. Florida, like what is, can you make us feel a little bit better about Southern California, because you looked at Miami with a somewhat gimlet eye, like you, you love it, but there's some, if visitors need to know a few things about visiting there, I believe. Yeah, I, I do love it here. I moved here in 1986 uh, from the United States. And I have, you know, I've, my wife is Cuban and Jewish. So like between the two things, I'm connected to everybody. And I can't ever leave is the point. Even though right now there is a hurricane approaching us. You notice how, how calm I look, even though there's a hurricane. Um, and I have come to love Miami, but it is a very weird, very weird place. It, I think at some point in the last couple of decades, uh, Florida replaced California as the weird state, you know, the, and thank you, you're welcome. Um, and it, like I said, we're like, we're like the Ellis Island for weird, stupid people. Not, <laughs> not everybody who does all these, you know, insane things is from here, but they all do them here. Like if a person decides for some reason, and this seems to happen a lot, that he needs to pleasure himself into a stuffed animal in the toy section of a Walmart. He might be in Cincinnati, but he's gonna to come to Florida to do that. <laughs> and, we, and we're like, oh, okay, you know, welcome, whatever, you know, you'll, well, fit, you'll fit right in here. Aside so, from, uh, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, that's all, I'm just saying we are, we're, it's a, a very weird state. It's good if you're a humor columnist. Uh, my friend, Carl Hyacin, who, who's a fantastic writer about Florida, has said um, accurately that you really, if you want to write humor in Florida, you really don't need an imagination. You just need a subscription to the newspaper because you can't possibly make up 
weirder, stupider things than people will do here every day. Yeah, I, I mean, they, from public transportation, like people accelerating into buildings to you, a, a shark on the monorail, like living yeah. marine yeah. life on, on public transportation you've talked about. Which we actually did. We, had a, we have a people mover here in, in Miami, which, as its name would suggest, is meant to move people. Wow. But, um, there was at one point a live shark on the, didn't, I mean, I'm not saying it was in good shape because it's really not a good marine environment, but that did happen. That's a true story, which I could tell at length, but that, yes, there was a live shark on the people mover. And that's only one sort of routine daily kind of activity here in the city we call Miami, Florida. Well, because truth is stranger than fiction. My next question was about to be what kinds of weird questions do you get from your fans and of course in the zoom webinar chat coming right right at 5 38 p.m that that's how that's how on time we are from bill alcofer wants to know dave colon i know bill alcofer do you this, this, <laughs> and he's i just want to state and if he's the same how many that can there be the bill alcofer i know is a photographer professional photographer who <laughs> i worked with at various olympics games and he's a genuinely insane human being. And I say that in case his question turns out to be in some way incriminating or weird. Yeah, I but just want to say that's the same bill, Dave. Just okay, yeah. good to know. Good to know. Okay, Thank you. Well, you're looking at the question. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Is it okay to ask, or are you going to get fired over this one also? Okay, never mind. I'll, okay, I will ask it. Okay, because. Go ahead, it's, fire away. Okay, Dave, which is the more effective moose deterrent? Wolf urine <laughs> or synthetic Wolverine urine. Okay, the reason Bill asked this is we were both in Norway, Will Lillehammer, Norway, covering the Olympics in, I believe it was 1992, was it? Whatever, 1992, I think, 1994, 94. <laughs> anyway, we were both there, and I believe Bill covered the story with me. The, the problem they were having uh, in Norway was moose were getting on the railroad tracks. I think it was moose. So they had to get, they had to come up with a way to keep the, the, the wolves off of the railroad tracks and they used wolf urine because I guess the moose are afraid of the wolves. The question I had, and I, I'm sure you have, is how do they get the wolf urine? I did not have that question. I wish I could unhear that. I don't even want to know how they, <laughs> how you make a wolf pee in like an, I, I don't think they would just voluntarily Pee in a bottle. I don't know. I don't know much about wolves, but the Norwegians, God bless them, they're a very, um, they're a very proficient people, and they somehow were able to obtain enough wolf urine to keep the moose off the railroad tracks, and the Olympics went off just great. Well, this is really going. Um, now that we're in this territory, let's talk about your colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's right, that is right, right in there. And I think what one of the all the columns are hilarious. This one is so hilarious that I really do tell people if you need a good cry because you're laughing so hard, reread. And it's not just because I'm 50 or the colonoscopy column. Um, and it is one of the most popular viral things that has ever I'm missing. So could you tell us a little bit of the story about that? So yeah, I wrote a, I, when I got my first colonoscopy, which was now over 10 years ago, um, I wrote, I wrote a column about it. And uh, that, you, as you say, it, it, it became extremely viral because everybody at some point has to get a colonoscopy. And I tell people, definitely, you know, I, I was afraid to do it. A lot of people afraid. Definitely do the colonoscopy. It's not, they give you wonderful drugs. I mean, so good that when it's over, you go, hey, let's do that again. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the one thing is they also, the preparation for the colonoscopy, I uh, just need to say they give you, they have to clean you out. I don't want to get too explicit here, but. They give, you, they give you a nuclear laxative that is so powerful that your bowels travel into the future and you expel food you have not even eaten yet. So that's the one kind of negative part. But everything else is just a piece of cake, if I may use that expression. It's not really appropriate, but that's, yeah. Well, and I have to say, I do, I have to quote something here. So you go, you were talking about the nuclear laxative. You go, have you ever seen a space shuttle launch? Yeah. That is pretty much the movie prep experience with you as the shuttle. Uh, yeah, you need <laughs> you to be, they are, should put a seatbelt on the commode <laughs> to hold you down. I mean, I, are we getting too, this is pretty, un, not very tasteful. It's, but, it's humor, it's funny stuff. We veer it off the rail. It's medically, medically important to know this. It is. <laughs> And I think there was a very special moment in your procedure where there was some romantic 
music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the guy who gave me the colonoscopy, his name is Andrew Sable. He's still my gastroenterologist. He's a great guy. He's a good friend. But they, they were playing music. And as they were like putting you under, and you are not, you're like in a vulnerable spot. You're like, you're, you're wearing that one of those uh, surgical things that really makes you feel more naked than if you're actually naked. You know what I mean? And, and there are people in the room, they're not all of your gender, uh, whatever your supposed to gender may be. And, and I'm, I'm like fight, kind of fighting the, cause the guy's putting the needle in and he's saying, you're going to fall asleep now. And I'm thinking, well, I don't think I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to fall asleep in this situation. And the song that the last thing I heard was Dancing Queen by ABBA, just blaring. And so I, I ended up writing about that in the column. And when I went in for my next colonoscopy five years later or whatever it was, Sure enough, Andrew waited till just the moment I was just going under and da -na -na, it blasted again. So I'm, I, it's my official colonoscopy song. I recommend it to everybody. It works yeah. fine. And as with 60s, with the, doing the drugs, you'd be happy to do it again. That's yeah, I would. Um, so, I, and I think going, oh my gosh, I, I, I have to say one thing before going to the next thing, but I think... Um, it's so hilarious. You were elected class clown by the Pleasantville High School class of 1965, which right. is your elected office, which I assume that you carried out. You've yes. also, in your spare time, occasionally run for president of the United States. And yes. it's, you're, if elected, your highest priority will be to seek the death penalty for whoever is responsible for making Americans install low flow toilets. Right. I, I do run for president regularly. And it used to be just sort of a way to get to you know, raise money. But now, and, and I used to be viewed as sort of a joke, but I honestly think this year, I'm not really, you know, I, I, I could have a shot. I think a lot of people are looking at me this year and going, huh, you know, that's what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, no, maybe you and Dan Quayle, if he's still around with his- Yeah, third. is he? Is he? I don't know. Dan, if you're out there, call, call me, call me. And as you've said of another president, most of your polyps are benign. So that's like a campaign slogan. <laughs> that was Ronald Reagan. That was my, yeah, going to be one of my, uh, my so, campaign uh, so uh, Lessons from Lucy, which just came out in April of last year. So it's a new book. And that is, okay, can you tell us Lucy is behind you, right? Lucy is. She's, yeah, the, the premise of this book was um, I turned 70. Well, I'm 73 now. So I turned 70 three years ago. And Lucy turned 10 um, three years ago. So in dog years, if you believe in that, she was turning 70. And the premise of the book was like, I was not happy about turning 70. I could deal with the other big decades, but 70, you can't really fake that that's old. That just feels really old. Um, <laughs> so, and I didn't like it. And I was like, you know, I was getting cranky and I was gonna like, I was kind of, kind of obnoxious to be honest. And then I, I, at some point I looked at Lucy, who is also this, you know, old, but is just handling it really, really well. And I thought, why is she so much happier than I am? And so I decided to, to like write a book basically about what is it that dogs do that makes them happy, no matter how old they get, it's, they, they're pretty good at staying happy. And, you know, could I um, do the same things except for the part about drinking from the toilet? Although if it worked, I would do it. I just want to stress that. And maybe a lack of a dog colonoscopy is helpful. They don't do, yeah, the dogs don't have to do that. So. that. That's one wonderful thing about being a dog. Like, I know when I'm going to the doctor because I make an appointment and I drive there and everything. She has no idea until we're actually entering the, and then like they have a really smooth floor. So even though she backpedals like crazy, she just skids on it, you know. She can't do anything about it at that point. I wish that would do that to me. Like, I wish that men, like ninjas, would show up and just throw a, you know, a blanket over me and tie me up. And then I'd wake up in the doctor's office and I'd go, okay, you got me. You know, but at least I wouldn't have to anticipate it, you know? Who would you will to me? And it would be cookie time. We have so many, we have more comments coming in than we can um, uh really cover but i do have a question or two for you um people yeah. go the uh, dave Barry 2020 you and kanye west or yes Dan in arizona you know so that he's available tanned rested and ready as i used to say yeah, uh, yeah. Art ambrose said love 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 insane city loved oh, it good. thank I'm you less, looking for more novels like that um so you have a lot of um, fans and we have uh sue rosen a long time reader and fans says base and this this is kind of like a snark she she said it was kind of 
question. Based on your past experience and timing with a book being made into a movie, do you have any plans for a movie about a virus pandemic that takes over the world? <laughs> Who would believe it? You know? Who would? <laughs> I, I'm guessing that there are people right now writing many corona, coronavirus related pieces of fiction. And by the time they come out, we're all going to be like, no, I'm not going to watch that. I, I was there. You know, I don't want to see it. So I'm telling those people, because I know it's Southern California, stop writing that screenplay. We don't want to see that movie. You know, you've done a really huge public service by just saying that. So can I thank you? Okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> you've I've done a lot of writing about men and women. I have, yes. So that sets up this question. If we have time, you know, it's kind of like, so you can answer this in any way. You know, you are an expert on relationships. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to go right into the newspaper reader trove and just throw you a question. It's okay. a big one. So sit there. I hope okay. you're ready. Okay. I am. As a single woman, okay, you ready? Do you want to pour a glass of water because it's a little lengthy? As a single woman, somewhere in her 60s, from a humorous standpoint, how do we meet single eligible men around the same age group who are not all looking for a woman 25 to 30 years younger and looking like they just walked off a Baywatch set? Next graph, so you ready? I'm right. a teacher, non-smoker, no drugs, rarely drink, and love acoustic folk music. Vicarious reader and kind towards others. Everywhere I go, I only see men all wearing wedding bands thought the divorce rate was about 50%. Where are these guys? I could go on, but I sense advice. If you could give some advice to this woman as you've given such sage advice to so many American women. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. First of all, she's absolutely right. Men are, let's just not, let's cut right to the chase here. Men are scum and men think they're hot when or that they're worthy of hotness when they're not i mean not even close so i hear you i hear what you're saying um and i have no cure i can no cure to offer you my my wife has many friends like you who are like wonderful women and and we all we're all my wife and i was going like why can't the, i mean where's the guy for this woman and and we don't know and we're, we're like maybe there's like a an island somewhere where all these men are hiding that the single nice guy who who are like age willing to have an age appropriate relationship i don't know but you know the the answer is i can offer you no hope whatsoever and that's my message to you i'm sorry well that's fantastic and i think it's been said that you know you have any advice books day bear this then or that the critics say you know have a lot of white space in them yeah yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm big on not really <laughs> answering questions as it's pretty clear from that you know yeah, I, do, I, I sympathize with that woman very much She's right, if that makes her feel any better. Yeah, and then it's, this is going really well in the chat for sure, because a, a gentleman named Kenny Jones, who I presume says, I'm not hot, darn. So this is going really super well. The healing has begun. Yeah. Kenny, the <laughs> Kenny is definitely hot. He, and he should get in. Let's connect Kenny with that woman. Kenny, do you like acoustic folk music? Because <laughs> we've got the gal for you. <laughs> Um, and can you just, you know, there is this kind of lingering question that you have answered, I think, before very wisely, is um, why do men leave the toilet seat up? Because there's a real danger if we put the toilet seat down that an animal will sneak up through the plumbing, a snake, for example, or a rat even. This happens all the time. In Florida. And you could go in there, open that toilet seat, and there would be the animal, this way you know it's there. But I think, isn't the actual issue that men leave the toilet seat up? Not that they yes. leave it down? Or which oh. seat are we talking about? There are two, there's a lid and there's the seat. Lid, the, 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 the seat, not the okay. lid. The are we room. allowed to leave the lid up? The lid is up, but not the seat. The seat is down. The Why seat do men, is down. Okay, the, da the danger there is a man will come in if the seat is down and be too lazy to lean over and pick it up when he uses the bathroom. And, and we're not the best, we're not, we don't aim that well. Oh. Um, so, so we're really looking out for your interest, women of the world, by, by keeping things sanitary that way. And also there is the issue of the snake or, or rat or wolverine even in some cases <laughs> that could work its way up through the plumbing and be lurking in there. If yeah. You know. 
Yeah, and that's why it's good to have the old fashioned plumbing, right? That we had before the low flow. Yes. It was strong enough to pull down. We had we had toilets that could suck down a mature sheep in this country. <laughs> we had the strongest toilets in the world before Congress yeah. got involved in our toilets. You know, and that's why I would say Dave Barry for president 2020. Thank you. Such a hilarious, thank you, you so. You can be on the Supreme Court, Sandra. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, yeah, after my- I don't care if you're a lawyer. I don't think you are. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that really this whole, uh, now you freaked out everybody in the toilet. Now the chat has just gone to hell as usual, you know, because now we're all thinking about- Did, the I, did I say something wrong in this? Yeah, sh sharks coming out of toilets. You've stimulated our imagination. So it's really fantastic. Um, but I think the Wolverine urine started it and now here we are, which is just the, the fantastic- time that we spent together takes me back to the uh, very first line of your online bio. Dave Barry was born in Armonk, New York in 1947 and has been steadily growing older ever since without ever actually reaching maturity. Thank you, Mr. Barry. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's nothing. It's and, nothing at all. Yeah, fantastic. And Dave Barry's latest book is, of course, Lessons from Lucy, and that is Lucy Bai. That is the nose that he's sitting on. Fantastic. All of it is funny. Time to buy it all over. And we're so honored to have the funniest man in America for our show today. And we're so thrilled you joined. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. To you, Samantha. Woo! Thank you. Wow. Okay. I needed that. And now I need a stiff drink. Um, thank you, everybody. Oh, my God. What a night. Um, this is our second to last lit up, Sandra. Can you oh believe it? Oh, my gosh. It has it, flown. We were so much younger when this started. Oh, I was so much younger. Um, so next week, um, and now my children are making noise in the kitchen. Um, next week, uh, it's our last episode. Where do we go from here? That's when we're going to talk about writing groups and um, opportunities for writing, uh, because we know secretly there are a lot of writers in this audience. Um, we're going to have Francis Mays of Under the Tuscan Sun fame, uh, marvelous Pam Houston, and um, novelist Janet Fitch, along with Amy Wallen. Uh, to register, uh, go to the link on the screen. And thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Marvelous Humorous, for supporting uh, Southern California newspapers. And we will see you next week. Ciao.